Hi, Sage Hens. Thanks for tuning in today for our inaugural Facebook Live broadcast. My name is Kayla McCulley, Pomona Class of 2009, and I'm the Director of Alumni Learning and Career Programs. And I'm very fortunate to be joined by one of America's leading contemporary writers and a member of our own faculty here, um, the Roy Disney Professor of Creative Writing, Jonathan Letham. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks. Thanks for uh, picking the book. <laughs> That's right. So this month, uh, our community of Sage Hens has been reading his award-winning book, Motherless Brooklyn, together as a community, and we're just really lucky to um, have Professor Latham here to chat about it, as well as his life as a writer. So we're going to start specific by first talking about the book, and we received a number of great questions from alumni, parents, and staff members who've been reading the book. And it's it's been just a really, really fun read for me, something different than I typically choose. But uh, so Motherless Brooklyn is a thoroughly modern take on a classic detective story featuring a narrator, Lionel S. Rog, with Tourette syndrome. So to start the discussion, I'm just going to read a brief passage that um, captures this glimpse into our narrator's mind. Here's the strangest of having a Tourette's brain, then. No control in my personal experiment of self. What might be only strangeness must always be auditioned for relegation to the domain of symptom, just as symptoms always push into other domains, demanding the chance to audition for their moment of acuity or relevance. Their brief shot could have been a contender at centrality. Personalityness. There's a lot of traffic in my head, and it's two-way. So tell us about the genesis of this book and especially the narrator. Sure, yeah. Well, it's a long time ago now, but um, I still remember vividly when I first became conscious of, um, well, what Tourette syndrome was. This was would have been 96 or 97. And, um, you know, it's hard to uh, recall this, I think, now, but that term was much less familiar and it was it was uh, much less common that you'd run across references to it in popular culture there weren't tv characters with tourette syndrome at that point and there weren't uh comedians making jokes about it or or um comparisons being made to politicians making gaffes it was kind of a, a much more uh just a medical term and um i first came across the reference to it in oliver sacks the great writer of medical case histories for the New Yorker, um, and he had two two great books that were collections of his case histories. One, which I think was the book that introduced him to a lot of people, called "The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat," and a slightly later one called "An Anthropologist on Mars." And there's actually a story or a, a case history about a character who was a real person, a real patient, who had Tourette's um, in each of those two collections. And so I was reading Oliver Sacks at this time and came across these two extremely beautiful, evocative narratives because he's, he's, he's a writer who brings his, you know, these medical, neurological subject matters uh, so brilliant, brilliantly to life for you. And I immediately thought, uh, well, I thought a couple of things. I thought, in some way, I feel this... Um, involvement with this or identification with it you know more than the other articles in his books i felt there was something about tourette's that was describing a kind of an experience or a sensation of consciousness that i identified with and felt kind of immediately complicit with um and i also thought this is somebody this is you know a character with tourette's is somebody i have to write about this is something i have to put into a story so it was it it felt uh like a piece of recognition for me of something that was going to be i was going to get involved in i didn't know how and i didn't know why and i didn't know what i would do with it but i just i just responded to it and i think in retrospect that there's something about the relationship to language that reminded me of aspects of my own uh traits of mind as a writer this development that i'd experienced of a kind of awareness of language as not just useful, but something to play with and distort and invert and transform uh, the way people who suffered Tourette's were involved with the language involuntarily um, seemed to have some relationship to the kind of uh, 
excitement and involvement and and you know uh, playful um, uh, compulsiveness that I felt about language. So. So there it was. I had this idea, and I, I was very lucky because around the same time there was a very good documentary film released uh, called Twitch and Shout, which portrayed the lives of I don't know six or seven different people with Tourette's. So then I also had this very visceral you know experience of seeing people on screen behaving and, and dealing with it. And the thing I got from the film that wasn't so much a part of the Oliver Sacks articles was what it was like for them to walk through the world of other people, the social... Uh, challenges, the pressure to find ways to exist in day-to-day -day reality, you know, in their family life, in a workplace, um, just walking down the street. And this, again, it seemed so provocative for me in terms of uh, storytelling, you know, to show a character who was dealing with this kind of issue, not just inside their heads, but as a, you know, day-to-day, hour-by-hour problem to solve. You know, this, this is the stuff of fiction. People who are in the world in some, uh, at some strange angle. And it creates narrative, it creates conflict, and, 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 you know, it may be very hard for the person who has Tourette's in real life to deal with this, but from the point of view of a storyteller, it was like pure gold. In some respects, it was almost as if you were creating a new language when you're describing and writing his his outbursts and and I was laughing out loud in parts of the book and I can imagine that for you as a writer those individual choices weren't you know they were well thought out and, and yeah making up the ticks was a lot of fun and it was also a lot of work because I had to make sure they were always you know um, serving a lot of purposes at once they couldn't just be amusing or strange they had to also be organic to the emotional situation and to the plot that was developing and you know I think eventually by the end of the book, I'd hidden a lot of the clues to the mystery in some of the language. Mm -hmm. So um, it was an extremely exciting book for me to write. It had a lot of velocity and energy in it. You know, I was um, I was always very kind of turned on when I was writing the book because the language had so much, uh, it had a kind of kinetic power of its own. Um, but organizing it and, and grooming it and making sure that the right words were in the right places that couldn't just be, uh, you know, uh, verbal salad all the time. It had to also all mean something. Um, that was the, the challenge. And one of our alums was curious to know how this book was received by members of the, the Tourette's community, whether people who are have the syndrome or family members. It's a great question. And, you know, it was something that I was, on the one hand, trepidatious about. I was very um, concerned that I get it right and that I not upset people. Um, but I also you know, at a certain level, once I'd done some homework and decided how my approach to it was going to work and began writing the book, I had to put this concern out of mind and just say, okay, for better or worse, this is my conception of it. This is how I'm going to present this. And um, I'll take that chance. I'll see what happens. Um, the thing I figured out pretty early on, and it was very essential, uh, was that people with Tourette's in terms of the way they're understood by outsiders and in terms of the way their families want to help them be understood you know it's often of course the situation that uh, Tourette's emerges in um, early adolescence so it's parents and very protective parents who really make up the heart of the kind of Tourette's advocacy community because what they're doing is fighting to get their kids uh, reasonable medical treatment but also to to help them adjust in schools and not be rejected by their peers. And so the the real core of Tourette's advocacy comes from parents of people with Tourette's for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, and what I found again and again reading about it as I was preparing to write the book was that um, the essential misunderstanding about Tourette's was that people mistake it for a kind of um, psychological imbalance, a kind of craziness and that it's exactly not that. It's a neurological disorder that's overriding um, behavioral and speech centers in the brain, um, and that people with Tourette's are adamantly wanting to be understood as normal, emotionally balanced, you know, functional people, and these behaviors are making it difficult for them to be seen that way. So I thought, you know, as much as I'm going to exaggerate 
in some ways, and I'm going to have a, a lot of fun, maybe a dangerous amount of fun with this subject matter. I'm going to make sure that I emphasize early and clearly that Lionel's position was that he was a sane person trapped inside this set of behaviors. And I guess by underlining that, I uh, earned a lot of good grace with people with from people with Tourette's and from their parents and their advocates and their organizations because the book was when it was published it was embraced and a lot of people thought that I was writing from a level of expertise that I didn't actually have in the sense of either being a sufferer myself directly or having a family member um, and in fact I had gone and in my research phase met a couple of people with Tourette's and spent a little bit of time uh, gathering you know, this kind of immediate first-hand experience of it, but not a whole lot. And uh, I was really lucky and I was really happy. I was really gratified by the way the Tourette's community kind of took the book on as a, you know, um, something they could be proud of and that they were willing to share with one another and with people who they wanted to have understand the condition um, from the outside. And so there was a brief period, you know, in the, in the years following the book coming out when I was in a way swept up into the Tourette's community. I started going to conferences and I would be invited to speak on panels and so forth. Of course, I was, in a sense, I was automatically over my head because everything I knew about it, I'd put into the book. It wasn't like I really had um, more knowledge. So when I would get into those situations where I was um, at a conference or, or you know, um, on a panel with people who had, you know, very eloquent sufferers who'd come of age with Tourette's, I would usually end up mostly in just a listening position, not, mm -hmm. not, you know, telling them what was what. But, mm -hmm. uh, but it was, it was, like I say, it was an honor and, and a relief to me that they felt that strongly about the book, that they welcomed me in, in, in that, in that way. And one of the, the passages that I found particularly striking and poignant in, in light of his recent passing was Lionel's affinity for the music of Prince. Yeah. It's, and and yeah. the, just the lyricism of that part of the book and, and really the musicality and the language mm -hmm. itself of the book. I know you're a, a big music buff. When we first met, you were playing a record on your record player yeah. in the office. So tell us about the role of music in your writing and your research. Well, it's funny that it became so, um, it's such a brief part of the book, really. There's like two or three pages on Prince, but it really was an entryway for me into writing about music, which I hadn't done to that point. Uh, I was such a big music fan and I did then and I still do always listen to it while I'm writing. So it feels like it has a strong relationship to my, um, my, I guess, to my uh, use of language, you know, that I think of it partly as lyric, you know, and that to me, good sentences do have a kind of a, a beat behind them. And, um, you know, that, that writing is a matter not only of uh, something cognitive and, you know, intellectual, but that there's a part of it that involves the body and the ear. So, I, I'm, I'm always flattered when people say that the writing strikes them as being musical in some way, um, because I, th I think I feel so much reverence for music. But I hadn't been someone who could say what music sounded like on the page until, in a way, Lionel kind of led me there with this passage that I backed into where I was writing about Prince and about that song Kiss and how much it meant to him. And of course, in retrospect, this was like a door opening for me because my next novel was a book called The Fortress of Solitude and it's almost all about uh, characters who have a strong relationship to, to music and um, and a conflicted one or one one of unfulfilled desire to make music or express themselves in that art form you know and, and fall short of it of being able to do so and in fact one of the main characters of that book is a music critic guy who writes liner notes for people's albums. So this whole idea of writing about music, in a way, Lionel talking about Prince on that page or two was a kind of a, a big stepping stone for me. And I've also gone on subsequently, even after that novel, to do it in a way that's even more direct, where I've written about music in a nonfiction 
context where I've written as a critic or a fan, basically, you know, mm-hmm. and talked extensively about what certain things mean to me. It was also sweet, one of those unexpected, you know, long-term windfalls from something you write that people associated me with Prince because of those pages and a few different people got in touch uh, mm-hmm. when Prince died and, you know, they sort of, uh, it's like I got to wear my love of Prince on my sleeve a little bit and, and that has led to interesting conversations. And The New Yorker did a podcast on Prince after uh, he died and I think one of their critics read uh, that passage aloud in the podcast. So, Yeah, one of my favorite songs too. Um, so we received several great questions from Tanya Miller, class of 93. Hi, Tanya, if you're watching. And she's interested to know if once you're in the writing zone for this particular book, if you just kept the dialogue flowing and there was a sub story that was cut that you might be willing to share. Oh, well, um, this book didn't involve a lot of uh, uh outtakes or extra material or wrong turns. I, I had a very clear plan for it. I mean, one thing about writing a, a crime story that has sort of clues and a solution where there's a mystery to solve is it forces you to work backwards in a way. You have to know the ending very clearly so that you can plant these um, clues and, you know, show, unveil the knowledge in layers like an onion. You have to kind of know what's going to be at the end. And so this was one of the most um, carefully planned books I'd ever written. And as a result, it was also one of the faster uh, books I'd written. I mentioned before the voice having a lot of velocity. Uh, It was also just the case that um, I'd cleared the decks in a way that, you know, life doesn't always make it simple for for you when you're writing a book. But in this case, I'd really excluded other commitments. And I just um, basically went from start to finish in 18 months. I think it may may be the fastest I've ever written a novel. Um, and I don't think there was ever like a a scene that I wrote that didn't belong in the book and that I ended up putting in the drawer. I don't do a tremendous lot of that in general. Uh, for me, I I usually have to feel sort of sure of where I'm placing my foot before I step. And so when I'm in doubt about how a plot develops or how a book is supposed to work. I don't just write for the sake of writing and then figure it out later and cut a lot of stuff. I, instead, I kind of stop. I tend to just wait to, to, to understand what the next right step would be and just think about it a lot. Mm-hmm. It might resemble inactivity or, or being blocked, but it doesn't actually feel like writer's block to me at that time. It just feels like I don't know yet what I need to do, and so I'm going to just kind of abide with the project and 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 take long walks and figure it out before I write again. Mm-hmm. So one final question about the book and then we'll turn to more about you as a writer. Sure. Um, again, this is from Tanya Miller and she had a question about the moments in the book where Lionel talks about some of his annoyances of detective novels. And I'm, uh-huh. I'm just gonna read a couple sentences here. Have you ever felt, in the course of reading a detective novel, a guilty thrill of relief at having a character murdered before he can step onto the page and burden you with his actual existence? Detective stories always have too many characters anyway. And characters mentioned early on but never cited, just lingering off stage, take on an awful portentous quality. Better to have them gone. And so her question, you know, was, was she saw this almost as breaking the fourth wall, if yeah. you will, the literary version of breaking the fourth wall. That's right. And, what your inspiration for writing that passage was? Well, you know, I mean, I guess it's it's a place where, I mean, in some ways I can almost relate it to that passage about Prince. It's a place where I'm writing and letting myself write as a fan of something at the same time as I'm creating a story. I had devoured so much, I mean, over the years, so much hard-boiled detective fiction specifically, Raymond Chandler and Ross MacDonald, and um, James Crumley and, you know, early um, uh, Elroy and so many other examples. And I'd begun to absorb it, you know, as a kind of formal pattern, almost like a sonnet. Detective stories always have to do this and this and this and this and this. And when you start to see that kind of deep patterning in a literary genre, 
it's very exciting because it, first of all, you, you think I could, maybe I could do that. Maybe I could, you know, um, dance those steps and produce the same result. Um, but it also starts to seem in a way like a, like a mechanism. And so for me anyway, with my love of genre and, and, and formal coherence and patterning in, in fiction, um, it seems to be accompanied, my interest in it and my, my excitement about it seems to be accompanied by the desire also to uh, point it out and sometimes to push it out of shape, to deform it a little bit. So in this book, you can see me sort of saying, yeah, it is like a, a breaking the fourth wall. I'm sort of saying, well, look, here we find ourselves enacting that pattern, you know, and it's great. It's really exciting, but also um, let's not pretend we haven't been here before. Or let's notice the pattern even as we're, you know, enjoying it. Um, so it isn't really critical, uh, or, or expressing a kind of exhaustion, but more like there's a joy actually in self-consciousness, you know, in being able to step outside and behold the thing that you're making, even as you're making it. Mm -hmm. So we also had some parents reading along and, um, turning now more broadly, one of our current Pomona parents, Margaret Latif would like to know about you know, your journey and, and process as a novelist, what do you find the most challenging aspects of writing and what advice would you have for perhaps a Pomona student yeah. who wants to become a novelist? Well, I mean, I, I, I have these conversations all the time because we have ambitious uh, undergrad writers who are, you know, not just experimenting with a poem or a short story here or there, but I've had every semester I've had several people who've started novels or, or you know, want to begin them or sometimes are deep into a draft and showing me portions of it, um, which is, it's thrilling. Uh, you know, I, I mean, the reason I do it, the reason I, I, I keep on doing it is for the, the, the love of it. You know, I, I, I don't write novels because I think it's an important thing to do or, um, for the rewards, although that there have been, I've been very blessed that way, but creating this other world that you can step into and kind of walk around inside um, that's a mental a mental construction full of recognizable parts of life people and places and stories and emotions is is the greatest pleasure I can imagine and something that I really love to do and so I the first thing I try to convey to my students is how much pleasure there can be found in this practice uh, which is good because it also requires inordinate amounts of patience and diligence. So there better be fun in it, you know, and the people who go forward with, with this, whether they're my students or other people who are, who are trying, um, are the people who locate that pleasure, you know, um, because you need something to sustain the, um, you know, almost unique degree of commitment that, uh, the novel requires to exploring something that doesn't exist in language over an incredibly long duration. You know, when I say I wrote this book in 18 months, that was very fast for me. Mm -hmm. Most of my novels have taken me something more like three or four years to write. And that time is going to include lots of periods of what I was describing just before of, you know, um, not knowing just being lost, uh, being interested and alive to the project, but really at a loss to understand uh, how to best fulfill its promises and how to make it come alive and, and how to extend it, how to make the next scene and the next and the next. Um, even very short novels are among the most, um, you know, extensive artworks that anyone can make, short of, you know, like writing an opera or a uh, you know, making a, a feature film. I mean, the number of sentences, the number of scenes, the number of decisions, if you just think of them as a giant pile of artistic decisions, you know, you have to get up every day and make a whole bunch of new ones. And um, you have no one who can really help you. Even a teacher can't really mm -hmm. do it for you. You are alone with this, you know, only you know what you had in mind. And you're the only person who's qualified to investigate this world that you've constructed. And, um, improve it and build more of it. And so it's, it's, uh, lonely work. Not everyone is suited to spend so much time alone with their own 
fantasies essentially um and um but it's it's really uh it's really a joy as well mm -hmm. that's actually a great segue into another question we received um from peter Klasquin, class of 97 um, how do you, as a professor, balance the seemingly contradictory aims of writing original work, but still make it accessible to a broad audience? Mm. Well, um, I don't, you know, I don't, first of all, I mean, some of my writing is m more esoteric or, or eccentric and, and only finds and only deserves a smaller audience than some other things I do. That's fine. That's normal. And, uh, you know, sometimes as you become uh, interested in the, all the peculiar avenues of, that literature affords, uh, you devote yourself to some part of it that is only going to interest a very small number of people who are fans of that sort of thing. But on the whole, I think the novel is a popular art form. It's not, you know, it's not uh, a top 40 song on the radio and it's, or it's not a superhero movie or a, 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 a HBO TV show. And people tend to exalt it as something very serious and very important and um, they can correspondingly become quite intimidated that the role of novelist is some sort of super intellectual thing that you need all kinds of academic training for, but it's not the case. Novels originated as a popular storytelling medium. Uh, in fact, you know, they were, when they first emerged, they were subject to uh, snobbish condemna condemnation for not being a highbrow form. You know, serious writing took place in lyric poetry or, or um, in essays. Novels were seen as kind of a middlebrow mm -hmm. thing at best. Um, and I still think that novels on the whole thrive, you know, the center of the practice of writing novels thrives on a strong relationship to um, vernacular culture, to the life of uh, the, the other arts and the, the popular arts. You know, it's why I think in my, in my age group, you have a lot of writers like me who are strongly engaged with um, graphic novels and films, pop music, and finding ways to make connections in their, in their writing to those forms. Because by its nature, the novel is, you know, um, connected to, uh, to life as we know it. It gobbles up, you know, uh, all kinds of other things and, and presents them. You know, when you find a writer like Dickens, who is sort of like the, he's like the ultimate novelist, right? His, his books are full of the street life of London and commercial jingles and, you know, the, the texture of, um, you know, uh, vernacular language, the way people spoke in the upper and middle and lower classes. The novel is meant to engulf all of this stuff. It's not off by itself in some high ivory tower. Mm -hmm. So one final question. We have, of course, our Goodreads group with about 200 sage hens and growing, and right. they're all eager to know uh, what would you recommend as a, as a next book for their summer reading session to kick off? Well, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about like great summer reads, right? It should be something <laughs> that you can actually um, have with you on the beach and, and, uh, and get lost in and, and um, and so I don't know if it's too long for you guys, but I am currently immersed in, um, a monster written by, uh, a Pomona alum. Um, it's called Sacred Games by, by Vikram Chandra, mm -hmm. who graduated here, I think in the, I think he's at, would, would have been a class in the, in the nineties and was a, a literature student, uh, but, but I don't know if he had an, I think he was an English major. He left behind anyway. Uh, a, a bunch of writings, you know, we have something called the creative writing emphasis here. Probably some of our listeners participated in this, in this themselves. We don't, you know, you can't major in creative writing at Pomona, but you can, um, get a certificate called the creative, creative writing emphasis for having practiced, uh, you know, 
either fiction or poetry or or personal essay writing and worked extensively in creative writing while you were here. And uh, Vikram is one of those who left behind in the English Department Library uh, a portfolio of his work while he was here. Anyway, he's a great storyteller. And uh, Sacred Games is, a, it, well, like Motherless Brooklyn, it's got a crime story in it. And it's got a de detective character in it. But it's also, it's um, set in India, and it's this gigantic, sprawling, well, I just mentioned Dickens. It's like a Dickensian world uh, that you get lost in. Uh, with dozens of characters and and you're glad to meet them all so that might be something for you guys to look at that's terrific pack it along on your uh, memorial day weekend bag um, so again if you're not already tuned in please join us on the goodreads group where we'll be sharing faculty recommendations over the summer we've asked our eight wig award winners to select some of their favorite reads so keep an eye out for that and I just want to, again, thank Professor Lethem for contributing this month's book, a really, really great work. If you are just tuning in and haven't yet read it, highly, highly recommend it. It's fantastic. And thanks again, Jonathan. Thank you, guys. And thanks for tuning in. See ya.